So about being sincere, I can only accomplish what I owe myself by fulfilling what I owe to what is truly good. That's why, why sincerity itself is not sufficient for a good conscience. Because I don't only owe good action to myself, I owe good action to the good. I'm responsible to the good as I am responsible for myself. And let me just add, there is a, a virtue that, whose name is prudence that is another name for being excellent in the use of conscience. Uh, just like you can be an excellent uh, marathon runner or you could be an excellent hockey player, you can have an excellence in making good ethical judgment. Uh, we all need to get better at it by practicing all the time. Now, that's about everybody's conscience, what is true by nature for the whole human race. Now I want to, in the last part of my talk, talk about the martyr's conscience as a way to specifically think about Christian conscience, a conscience which is uh, shaped and uh, vivified by the grace of Jesus Christ. And this is very important, I think, for us as we think about our activity as Catholics in advancing the three goods uh, mentioned in the Manhattan Declaration. In seeking to grasp the quintessential shape of a Christian conscience, I would like here to uh, acknowledge that I'm only pursuing the strategy of Pope John Paul II in his encyclical Veritatis Splendor, where he identifies a martyr's conscience as the kind of, pardon me, a martyr's conscience as the paradigm, the archetype for the conscience of all Christ's disciples. The Holy Father wrote, it is by looking at how a martyr's conscience works that we can see most clearly what a specifically Christian conscience is. Although martyrdom represents the high point of the witness to moral truth, truth about good and bad, although martyrdom represents the, the apex, the high point of the witness to moral truth, and one to which relatively few people are called, there is nonetheless a consistent witness which all Christians must daily be ready to make, even at the cost of suffering and grave sacrifice. Indeed, faced with the many difficulties which fidelity to the moral order can demand, even in the most ordinary circumstances, the Christian is called with the grace of God invoked in prayer to a sometimes heroic commitment. In this, he or she is sustained by the virtue of fortitude, whereby, as St. Gregory the Great teaches, one can actually love the difficulties of the world for the sake of eternal rewards. In other words, our consciences as Christians is the same as our neighbor's conscience, who may be a Muslim, uh, may have no particular faith. And yet our consciences are different precisely because they are elevated by God's grace. A martyr's conscience is the most elevated, the most exalted of all Christian consciences. But as the Holy Father says, there are times, there are situations in which all of us, even though we don't face the possibility of the firing squad or uh, stoning, when we all have to suffer for the sake of what our conscience tells us is the good to be done here and now or the evil that must at all costs be avoided. So, let's talk a little bit about the graced conscience, the conscience in which the Holy Spirit uh, is indwelling. 
First of all, to point out, as I've already hinted, that not only by natural insight do we Christians make judgments of conscience, but we make our estimates, our recognitions occur under the guidance of grace of the Holy Spirit. And these graces are both internal and external. The graces that are internal are the movements of God, the insight we gain by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. The external graces are the revelation of Jesus Christ, the truth taught in the church, uh, the example of our uh, neighbors, of the example of the saints, the guidance we receive from our pastors, from one another. Uh, what we're all doing here today the hours you have each spent to witness to the rest of us that these are important goods to be defended. This too, these are graces. This is part of the grace of the Holy Spirit that helps all of us have a right conscience. A little bit more about the nature of the truths that shape the martyr's conscience. These are norms about ethical behavior. Some of the norms are norms that are knowable by nature, but are profoundly uh, taught to us and more clearly uh, presented to us because of the teaching of Christ and the apostles. There are certain norms that actually go beyond what is required by nature. And these two are part of uh, what shapes our Christian conscience. The second thing I would point I would make in talking about the nature of the truths we recognize uh, when uh, we exercise a Christian conscience is that um, we see that the absolute truth, the absolute good, uh, which is uh, in, in which the good things that are the doable good things participates, is a person. I recognize that this is not just a principle, this absolute goodness. As a Christian, I know that this is somebody. Uh, this is God making a demand on my behavior. It is all of us, it's a part of not the nature of the human person to uh, experience the absolute good as requiring me to act in a certain way. What I know by my faith is the name of the absolute good. He is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the extreme gravity of the obligation imposed upon the martyr by his or her conscience, one that binds on pain of death, is an obligation to do the good and avoid the evil, lest I lose my life in God. This incomparable obligation sees the absolute good as God, as holy, and the absolute good as my beloved. Not just a basic principle, a foundation of ultimate being and good present in the world about me, but I recognize that the good in Jesus Christ, God has drawn close to me and he has spoken to me, and he is not just an obligation, but he is inviting me to love him back with the same love in the same measure with which he has first loved me. So, in the Christian conscience, the martyr hears not only what God is saying about what is good and bad, but he hears it as said by God himself. He hears it said by the one who is holy and by the one who has invited him to love him back 
with the same depth of fidelity as with which he has first been loved by love himself. And this is the source of one of the sources of the incomparable courage of the martyr which the Holy Father speaks of. I'm not going to spend a lot of time making an application because I hope it's obvious that this is the kind of conscience which we are invited to bring to this struggle to uh, protect these three goods. Uh, to have the kind of courageous depth of commitment to advance these goods and to avoid being complicit in evil that the martyrs themselves had. Uh, this is the measure of faithful Christian citizenship. The martyrs, not as a measure of the average, but the martyr, to use a more trite example, the martyr, the way a, uh, a man who can pitch a no-hitter is a, is a measure for what it really means to be a good pitcher in baseball. He's the hero. He is uh, the epitome of this kind of conscience. Now, let me just uh, move to conclude this third part by some remarks about what a martyr's conscience is not. First of all, it's very simple to see that a martyr's conscience is not coward. A martyr is someone who has not submitted himself to the rulers. Now, typically, we might think about kings and princes and emperors and such like. But there are a lot of ways for uh, rulers to be present in the world. Sometimes rulers are the media. They rule. Uh, sometimes judges are the rulers. Sometimes my neighbor is the ruler. There are a lot of forces that seek to shape my action and be my ruler. A martyr's conscience never permits the martyr to uh, succumb to rulers who demand something that's bad. A martyr's conscience uh, is not one that is stalwart for something that is really vicious. That's just somebody who's stubborn. Uh, you can't be a martyr to uh, Nazism. This is not possible. Uh, a martyr's uh, courage uh, is uh, only noble when the martyr's cause is noble. And we have to be careful in our contemporary life where there's so much emphasis on the authenticity of an individual that we don't simply equate a martyr with anybody who seeks to be true to her or his own convictions. A martyr in being true to her convictions is being true to the truth, and specifically to the revealed truth, the truth taught by Jesus Christ. And uh, that is at the essence of, of martyrdom. Now to conclude, uh, if the martyr as a figure represents for you and me a kind of measure for the commitment we all are called to make toward it, uh, serving the good and avoiding evil, then I think it's very helpful to concretize who exemplifies the example of, of the martyr. And we could think of some very, very distinguished uh, contemporary martyrs. Uh, might think of uh, uh, St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, Edith Stein, or we might think of St. Maximilian Kolbe. Uh, very much in mind, keeping in mind that our Holy Father these days is in England, I would like to hold up St. Thomas More as the embodiment of the martyr, as uh, the exemplar, as the model for how Christians are to act uh, within uh, the sphere of, of what's doable.